Today's video is sponsored by Dashlane. You guys can get 50% off the cost of a Dashlane premium plan. More on them in a bit. August the 22nd, 1485. Two armies prepare to give battle on a field in central England. At stake is nothing less than the crown and all power and wealth that comes with it. By the end of the day, one king will be dead, another will be crowned. And the course of English history, it's going to have been changed forever. Bosworth was not a single event. It was a culmination of 20 years of civil war, an uncommonly violent period when England's noble families took turns killing each other on either the battlefield or on the chopping block. Almost all the ancestral ruling families were either annihilated or severely depleted, paving the way for a new generation to take England forward into the Renaissance. The wars at the Roses, as they are called today, weren't just a contest between the houses of Lancaster and York over who should rule England. It was a story of a series of interconnected families feuding with each other for reasons both petty and also vast. The two years before the Battle of Bosworth Field in particular read more like drama than they do history, which would explain why everyone from Shakespeare to George R. R. Martin has taken inspiration from it when writing celebrated fictional works. Here, however, is the true story, at least as true as we can tell from what has survived the passage of five centuries. In 1485, it seemed that the Wars of the Roses were over. King Edward IV had ruled England unmolested since 1471, following over a decade of violence, starting when his father, Richard Duke of York, had challenged the feeble-minded King Henry VI for the throne. Edward's father and his younger brother, Edmund, were killed in the fighting, but so was King Henry and his son, along with most of the supporters of the House of Lancaster. Everyone else had fallen in line and peace returned to England for the most part. Edward was a larger-than-life personality, just like the most successful kings of his period. He had a voracious appetite, both at the dinner table and also in the bedroom. His wife, Queen Elizabeth, bore him ten children, including two boys who were alive and healthy in 1483, Edward, Prince of Wales, and Richard, Duke of York. With his heir and despair in place, it seemed King Edward's hold on power was very secure. Now, every good story does need a villain, and in this case, that role falls to Edward's younger brother, Richard. Given the title Duke of Gloucester, when his brother became king, Richard had neither Edward's impressive physicality nor his congenial personality. Investigation of his remains found he suffered from scoliosis, an extreme sideways curve of the spine. While this did not make him the shambling hunchback portrayed in the Shakespeare play, it definitely made him both smaller and weaker than average as well as malformed. One shoulder was higher than the other. The near constant pain this condition presumably caused him may be why he seemed much less interested in sex than his brother was, having no known mistresses after his marriage in 1472, which only produced a single son. Despite these setbacks, Richard worked hard to cultivate a masculine image, winning renown on the battlefield for his bravery and skill. He led the vanguard of his brother's troops in the climactic battles of 1471, after which he was given almost complete control of the north of England by Edward, who hoped that his brother would would create a bulwark there against the encroachment of neighboring Scotland. In all that time, he had become his brother's most trusted lieutenant, never showing any signs of disloyalty. He was certainly more trustworthy than his other brother, George, Duke of Clarence, who was drowned in a battle of wine for treason in 1478. Edward also believed that if anything were to happen to him, his brother would be as loyal to his son as he had been to him. In this case, he was wrong. Despite the fact that his heir was only 12 years old in 1483, too young to rule on his own, Edward IV had made no plans for the succession if he died before the Prince of Wales reached majority. He probably figured he had more time. He was, after all, only 40 years old. He might have expected to reign for at least another 10 or 15 years before death started encroaching on him. It was a shock to everyone when Edward became sick on Easter Sunday and his condition steadily worsened. Scrambling, his advisors made sure that he signed off some modifications to his will, naming his brother as Lord Protector, and then the king died on April the 9th. Immediately, plans were put in place to crown the young Prince Edward V, and Richard moved south to London to take his place in the planning for the succession. There were now two main factions in play, the one led by Richard and one led by Dowager Queen Elizabeth and her family, the Woodvilles. Whoever controlled the young king was going to be the one 
controlling the country. Richard struck first, intercepting the young king's party as it traveled from Wales to London, and arresting his guardian, Earl Rivers, his uncle. Richard had Rivers and the other members of the Woodville clan executed on charges of treason and escorted Edward V himself into London. The boy was placed inside the Tower of London, supposedly for his own protection. Now, it seems unlikely that Richard started out with the intent to seize the throne for himself, as some have suggested. Nor does it seem likely that the Woodvilles would pick a fight with one of the most powerful men in the kingdom, forcing Richard to respond as some of Richard's defenders allege. The most realistic explanation is that, at least in the beginning, Richard acted as he did because he wanted the sole power behind the throne, having absolute control of his nephew and therefore the power of the crown for himself. So he preempted the Woodvilles and took them out of the running as quickly as he could. Now, we can only speculate on why this didn't work, but the most likely explanation is that the Regency Council realized that without the Woodvilles to act as a bit of a counterbalance, Richard would have all the power and they would have absolutely none. Therefore, they began to pull away from him. This prompted a violent reaction from Richard, who had Lord William Hastings, one of his brother's most loyal supporters, dragged out of the council chambers and beheaded while arresting others that he accused of disloyalty. It's at this point that Richard probably decided to act on what had been considered up to that stage a deep, dark family secret. The belief that his brother Edward was illegitimate, the product of an affair that his mother had had while her husband was away. If true, it would explain why their father was so cold toward Edward and favoured his other children, especially his second-born son Edmund. Now, Obviously, he couldn't go around announcing this to the public. It would shame his family, especially his mother. Instead, he found a reason to declare his brother's children illegitimate instead, both barring them from the throne and putting all of the shame on the dead king. It just so happens that this also made him next in line for the throne, and well, he took full advantage, crowning himself King Richard III in June 1483. Alright, we'll get back to today's video in just a second, but first, here's a word from today's sponsor, Dashlane. Maybe you, like me, spend a lot of time on the internet. I'm guessing that you do. For me, it's a lot of YouTube, it's a lot of Google, then there's also all the streaming, the subscriptions, all that stuff. Now, I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to remember all that stuff. Perhaps you can relate. Dashlane gives me both more time and better security by storing all of my passwords, payments, and personal information in one secure place that only I can access. And when I want to use that information to log into an account or buy something, it autofills that data for me on every site in just a click. Dashlane is powered by patented security technology and machine learning, which is why it consistently ranks as the best password manager available, no matter the device or browser you're using. It makes every shop experience a one-click checkout, stores all of your passwords so you're never locked out of an account, and provides a VPN for streaming content and secure browsing. In essence, it's the essential tool for your home or your business or when you're using the internet. And right now, you can try it for free on your first device by going to dashlane.com forward slash geo50 or using my promo code geo50 to get 50% off and upgrade to a premium plan across an unlimited number of devices. You can't do much better than that. Grab yourself some Dashlane. And let's get back to today's video. Many people in England were rather unimpressed with the way that Richard had seized power, especially given what happened next. In August, Prince Edward and his brother Richard, imprisoned in the tower since their uncle's coronation, disappeared. To this day, nobody's sure what happened to them, but it was widely believed at the time that they were murdered at the new king's orders. An attempt had just been foiled to spring the boys from captivity, and Richard probably thought that by killing them, he would destroy any rebellions aimed at replacing him with his nephew. In fact, this was a colossal blunder. Even during the Middle Ages, the murder of innocent children was pretty horrifying to most people, an unpardonable sin against God himself. It also set the surviving Woodvilles, led by Queen Elizabeth, was looking for someone, anyone, to replace Richard as the king. Now, under normal circumstances, Henry Tudor wouldn't even have dreamed of challenging for the crown of England. His parentage was a bit peculiar, maybe say in the least. His grandfather, Owen Tudor, was a Welsh courtier and fell in love with and married a widowed French woman, Catherine of Valois, who bore him several children. The only rub was Catherine's first husband was the late King Henry V of England, and her other child was now King Henry VI. 
Knowing that allies of royal blood were always useful, Henry had his two half-brothers, Edmund and Jasper, made earls and arranged for 24-year-old Edmund to marry 12-year-old Margaret Beaufort, who also had royal blood in her. Edmund died at the beginning of the War of the Roses, leaving a 13-year-old widow who was pregnant with his only child, Henry. Henry Tudor was by inheritance the Earl of Richmond, but he'd never even seen the estates that he was entitled to by law. After growing up in Wales, he'd spent the last dozen years in exile across the English Channel in Brittany, following the failed attempt to remove the Yorkists from power in 1471. Henry and his uncle Jasper were officially guests of the French Duke of Brittany, who liked to use the Tudors as bargaining chips to get what he wanted from Edward IV. Now, despite their claim being dubious at best, they were still Lancasters, and therefore they were Edward's enemies. In 1483, Henry was really the only member of the House of Lancaster left who had any claim to the crown, whether dubious or not. The rest had all been wiped out. He was it. So it was to Henry that everyone opposed to Richard III hitched their wagon, not only what was left of the Lancasters, most of whom were similarly in exile, but also disaffected Yorkists as well. The most prominent of these was Queen Elizabeth, who reached a deal with Henry's mother, Lady Margaret, that should Henry assume the throne, he would marry King Edward's eldest daughter, also named Elizabeth, which would unite both houses together and end the strife between them. Henry's first evasion attempt came in October 1483, coinciding with an internal rebellion led by the Duke of Buckingham. A powerful channel storm prevented Henry's fleet from crossing for a week, and when they did, they found the ports were controlled by Richard's men. Buckingham's rebellion had collapsed, and he would later be arrested and beheaded. Henry sailed back to Brittany, his efforts seemingly counting for nothing. In September 1484, the Duke of Brittany struck a deal with Richard to send the Tudors to England. Having gotten word of the plan, Henry escaped Brittany on horseback and fled to the French court of the child king, Charles VIII. The French, always willing to stir up a bit of trouble for their English neighbours, welcomed him and allowed him to plan another invasion with their blessing. They even gave him money and troops to supplement his own small force of exiles. Meanwhile, Richard was struggling to maintain his hold on England. His son and heir, Prince Edward, died in April 1484, aged 10, followed by the death of his wife Anne in March 1485. Rumours circulated that he planned to undermine Henry Tudor by marrying his own niece, Elizabeth of York, which would have been strange even if they hadn't been closely related, considering he'd declared her a bastard and murdered her brothers. The fact that he had to make a public denial that he planned to do this was humiliating for him, and shows the growing unpopularity with which he was contending in 1485. Throughout 1485, all of Europe held its breath as they waited for Henry's invasion. Richard certainly knew it was coming, as he spent the summer preparing his defences. His hope was to draw Henry into a battle of annihilation, allow him to land somewhere far from London and march into England, gathering all of the traitors to his banner and allowing the king to kill all of them at once. There was to be no quarter given, no pardons issued, just the sword settling the question of who deserved to rule England once and for all. Henry left Honfleur on August the 1st, crossing the channel at the head of 5,000 men, most of the mercenaries provided by the French king. He landed in southwestern Wales on the 7th and marched first north and then east at lightning speed, crossing the English border and reaching the town of Shrewsbury on the 16th. Along the way, the joint forces with a large number of Welshmen who supported him, doubling the size of his army. They also provided food for Henry's army, meaning he didn't have to slow down and forage for supplies. News of the invasion reached London on August the 11th, and messengers were immediately sent out to begin assembling the royal army at Leicester. They were able to begin doing this on the 16th, with Richard arriving on the 19th. Thanks to a system in place known as bastard feudalism, each of the powerful magnates in England maintained large numbers of paid retainers, essentially their own private armies, who could be mustered at at a moment's notice to fight for their lord. These lords, in theory, owed their loyalty to the king. In practice, however, they were often an entity onto themselves. One of the largest of these self-reliant entities was the Stanley clan of Cheshire in Lancashire. Thomas Lord Stanley could raise a host of 5,000 men all by himself and was an expert at playing hard to get with both sides in the War of the Roses until he figured out which side was going to win. He appeared to be doing so again, sending his forces south in the direction of both Henry and Richard's men without making his intentions known for which side he was going to support. 
On the night of August 21st, Richard's army encamped on Ambien Hill, what he believed to be a strategically important point south of the town of Market Bosworth in Leicestershire. Henry's army was southwest of him, at the village of Benny Drayton, along the main road to Leicester. And Lord Stanley's army was between both of them, off on its own at Dadlington, in position to support either army based on what he decided. Both had reason to believe they had Stanley's support. Stanley was Henry's stepfather, while Richard held Stanley's son, Lord Strange, as a hostage against his father's good behaviour. On August 22nd, both Henry and Richard's army marched to meet each other at a place that would become known as Bosworth Field. Henry's force numbered about 8,000 men. The would-be king had no military experience, so he let the bulk of his troops be led by John Tavere, the Earl of Oxford, a battle-hardened Lancastrian that had escaped from prison in the English fortress of Calais when his jailers turned on Richard. Henry formed the reserve behind the main battle line with a small number of mounted retainers. Richard's army was larger, between twelve and 15,000. His main battle line was split into two wings. The left led by Henry Percy, Earl of Northumberland, and the right led by John Howard, Duke of Norfolk. Richard, like Henry, led a force of heavy cavalry behind the main line. Richard's on St. Edward's crown, the heavy jewel-encrusted coronation crown, believed to date back to King Edward the Confessor in the 11th century, and rode along his battle line in an attempt to inspire morale. He then swapped it out for his helmet, which had a gold circlet embedded within it. It was then that Lord Stanley made his intentions known, adjusting his position so that he formed the right flank of Henry's army. It was likely that it planned to do this all along, and had been in communication with Henry in the days before the battle. It was a masterful piece of deception that infuriated King Richard, who ordered the hostage Lord Strange beheaded. However, the guards prudently decided to wait on the outcome of the battle first. If Richard won, they'd kill Strange, and the king wouldn't be the wiser. If he lost, however, it'd be in their own best interest to keep the man alive. As in many battles, the tactics were dictated by the terrain. Oxford and Stanley's forces were positioned on either side of a march that would force Richard to divide his army, Norfolk attacking Oxford and Northumberland attacking Stanley. The rebels knew that the king had to attack them, despite the disadvantage in terrain. If he retreated without fighting, his authority would erode to nothing, and his army would probably fall apart. Richard clearly understood this. When he was advised to pull back, he responded, God forbid I yield one step. This day I shall die like a king or triumph. Henry's strongest troops were positions on the left flank. With Stanley protecting his right and the marsh his centre, the left was where the fighting would be strongest. Norfolk's men marched to contact, hitting Oxford's men hard. After a short fight, Oxford signalled for his men to fall back into tightly packed defensive pike squares that the Royal Army promptly attacked. As predicted, the fighting was hardest on the left, with the French mercenaries savaging the Royalists within attacking wedge formations. This was an up close and personal brawl, the air filled with the sounds of clanging metal yells of fury and screams of pain and the sickening thuds of weapons contacting flesh. The weapons involved would have ranged from footmen wielding pikes and bills to mounted horsemen armed with swords, axes, maces or lances. Richard's archers primarily used famous English longbow, while Henry's force of French-made crossbows and some used the arquebus, a matchlock firearm just coming into use in Europe. Northumberland, on the other hand, was stuck where he was, unable to engage. Most of Stanley's men opposite him were hidden behind the ridge line, and if he tried to advance, it was likely that he'd be attacked from his flanks and annihilated. The Earl was left relatively impotent, reduced to using the majority of the army's cannons to attempt to either force Stanley off the hill or induce him to charge, neither of which he did. King Richard watched the battle unfold, probably frustrated that it was turning into a stalemate, and then, like a gift from God, a gap opened up in Oxford's right flank, and there was Henry Tudor, unprotected but for his personal bodyguard. Richard saw a chance to end it all with one decisive blow, kill the pretender and his throne secure. He organized his reserve and led a cavalry charge straight at the Lancaster commander. It was probably the last great charge made by fully armored medieval knights anywhere in Western Europe, a fitting closure to the Middle Ages. It was the kind of charge that the bards sing ballads about. Richard's charge took Henry by surprise. Richard fought valiantly, killing Henry standard bearer and up horsing, a jousting champion who rode with him, and he supposedly came within a sword length of Henry himself before being driven back by Tudor's bodyguards. Then another cavalry charge, this one led by William Stanley, Lord Stanley's brother, struck home with devastating effect. William had broken off from his brother's force at the start of the battle with a large contingent of mounted knights, and had been screening Henry's right flank against Northumberland while he saw Richard's charge. 
Now it was Richard's turn to be surprised and overwhelmed. More and more Lancastrians were joining the fray, increasingly outnumbering the king's beleaguered knights. The royal emblems he wore on his armor and the crown on his head made him a perfect target. Still, Richard continued to fight despite the odds. A far cry from his depiction in Shakespeare as a coward fleeing the field, willing to trade his kingdom for a horse. Eventually, an unknown soldier struck him in the back of the head with a halberd, knocking him off his horse. Once he was down, the soldiers crowded around him, hacking and stabbing at him until it became obvious he was dead. The first English monarch to be killed in battle since Richard the Lionheart in 1199. The death of Richard happened at almost the same moment his army started to come apart. In the hard-fought action on the left flank of Henry's line, the Duke of Norfolk was killed, supposedly in single combat with Sir John Savage, a nephew of Lord Stanley. Many other high-ranking supporters of Richard were either slain on the field or captured. As word spread of the king's death, what was left of his forces disintegrated and the Battle of Bosworth Field was over. Richard's fateful charge had been decisive just not in the way he wanted. Lord Stanley, later made the Earl of Derby, is said to have found Richard's crown after the battle was over and placed it on his stepson's head, both a symbol of victory and a reminder to the new king of who had played an integral role in putting him on the throne. His son, Lord Strange, survived the battle, his captors never carrying out Richard's order to execute him. Richard, meanwhile, was buried in Greyfriars Church in Leicester, and it was believed his remains were destroyed during the Reformation. However, in 2012, a skeleton was discovered at the site where the monastery once stood, and DNA analysis proved that it was that of Richard III. On March 23, 2015, an elaborate ceremony was held, and the remains were reinterred at Leicester Cathedral. His motto, Loyalt me lie, loyalty binds me, was inscribed on his tomb. Henry Tudor faced no further resistance to his march to London and was crowned King Henry VII in an elaborate ceremony at Westminster Abbey in October. Two months later, he fulfilled his pledge to marry Elizabeth of York, and one by one, all the lords and magnates came forward to pledge their loyalty to the new king. Unlike all the other transfers of power that had taken place over the last 20 years, this one had no significant opposition force to rebel against it. And it's not hard to see why. The House of York had effectively wiped itself out through infighting after having already destroyed the House of Lancaster. The only one left standing was Henry VII, whose Tudor dynasty would rule England for over a century. He combined the Red Rose of Lancaster with the White Rose of York to form a new symbol the Tudor rose, and did everything he could to establish his legitimacy over the following decades, including executing anyone who might pose a threat to his new regime. Bosworth Field marked the end of an era. Not only had the Wars of the Roses ended, but so had the Middle Ages in England. The Tudors would consolidate power in the hands of the crown, thus weakening the overmighty nobility and their private armies. Henry VIII even seized control of the country's church as all of Europe grappled with the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s. The monarchy that was in place when Queen Elizabeth I the last Tudor monarch died in 1603 was a lot different than the one Henry VII seized by force in 1485. One wonders what Richard III would have thought about that. Perhaps something along the lines of, Now is the winter of our discontent. Now, just before you leave today, maybe you're looking for something else to watch. Why not check out my new channel called War of Graphics? Want to know all of the details about some of history's most famous battles and wars? Come join me on War of Graphics from Sherman's March to the Sea to Operation Barbarossa. If it's got people fighting each other, or occasionally animals, we will cover it. There is a link below.